<coughs> Welcome to session two. I know that session one was a bit overwhelming, and this can be as well. Yesterday, Christine and I went through the slides, and she was a bit like, whoa, it's a lot of detail for, <laughs> for some things. And it is true that I think I'm so exciting, excited to share all of this with you that I may go too much into detail. Um, but you have the recording. You can watch it as many times as you want. So, of course, you don't need to get all the information at once. Don't feel too, especially if, if you have just started this, too many inf information at the at the same time. <clears throat> you can just plant, put one tomato plant and it's going to grow happily. Like, you don't need to take into account so many things at the same time. So, you can, you can decide by yourself the level of complexity. So, don't get too overwhelmed. You, I'm going to expose to you, like, the information. And then this is a, like a buffet. You don't need to eat everything at once because then you will get, yeah, you will get ill. So you can select what things do you pick. So yeah, please don't get overwhelmed. Uh, yeah, if I see that, if I see that I go too much into detail, Christine is going to, I mean, <laughs> shut up or stop. Um, well, we don't need to introduce ourselves again. So I'm Alex, and Christine is here in pink in the in the window. And uh, we are all, we are both living around East Sin, and we came out with this idea. Yeah, into my tomatoes. Um, so, again, during this session, we are not going to uh, start to plant, but yesterday we were talking a bit, and actually, there is a couple of plants that we think that you can put, and they are relatively simple. So, we are going to mention them during the presentation, if you want to give your first steps during winter. So today we are going to talk about seeds and types and this is also to start to guide you when you are going to buy your seeds because when you enter in a seed shop it's like everything is names and strange names and it's very complicated to understand and you need to be googling, <laughs> googling everything because you don't know what they are talking about. So it's to give you a bit of vocabulary to understand that. Um, we are going to talk of uh, the veggies if you want to grow them for leaf or for fruit the nutrients and the light requirements of some common plants that most of us have, like they are the basics, like courgette, tomatoes, cucumbers, so only the basics. We are going to touch a bit companion planting, and this is the, when it gets complicated and the part that I love, because it's about um, relationships between different plants and the, how they can help each other. So I, I, it's ecology, it's ecology in your garden. So I really like it, but I understand that it's very complicated, so don't get scared. Uh, and then we're going to, again, give you some homework. And remember that in the in the third session, we will be a bit of a workshop, so we won't mute the phones, and it's going to be more interactive, and we're going to put all this information together. So the first session and the second session are very important for the workshop that we will have in the, in the third session. Uh, and that's it. Christine, if you want to add something at any point, feel free. Yes, uh, No, not at the moment, no. So, we go into it. Type of seeds. Um, I don't know if you hope will have heard about these ones, but they are called F1. And these are hybrid seeds. You can have hybrids occur naturally in the wild, but these ones are more created um, artificially, many, many, very often by hand pollinating. So they take the brush and they take from one flower and to another flower. And what they do is that they take, for instance, two plants that are very interesting or very good because they give very good tomatoes or it's a plant that is very strong and resistant to diseases. And they mix the mom and the father and they have like one, one offspring and this offspring is wonderful. Like it's more vigorous, it's stronger, it gives uh, bigger fruits. So these are called F1. Now, what it happens very often is when you... When you save the seeds of this F1, many times the seeds are or not fertile or the or when, when it germinates, the plant is very weak because it's like a second generation. So the F1 was strong, but then the, the offspring of this F1 are not going to be strong. So normally it's not even worth to, to keep the seeds and you end up, end up need to buy more. That's why uh, Christine and I, we don't... We don't buy F1s, we prefer to keep the seeds. Otherwise, you are spending, I don't know, 20, 30 pounds occasionally, every year. Occasionally, I buy the F1s if I know that it's a, a plant that's uh, difficult to save the seeds on. Okay. So, yeah. 
Me, I, I don't, I'm not sure I had any, but yeah. In general, we prefer saving our own seeds. Yeah. yeah. And then do exchanges and things. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> then we have grafted plants. And this is uh, effectively a hybrid because I don't know if you see here very well, but you see that the root is different from the stem. So they have taken the root of one plant and they have uh, incorporated with the stem of another plant. This is very common in trees as well sometimes, that you have in the same tree apples of different varieties. And it's, it's kind of the same thing. They mix together two plants. So it's an hybrid. This is very common in aubergines and, yeah, and, in other, and in other veggies. And it's supposed to give more strength to the plant as well. So in the name, you, can, you may see grafted. And this is what it means. Then you have open pollinated seeds, and this is for the ones that we, Christina and I, we normally go to. They are less perfect if you compare with the F1 hybrids, so the tomatoes are not going to be that perfect, or maybe they are more prone to diseases, but they are fertile seeds, so you can keep that seeds and keep them during years and years, and they are going to be fertile. So we tend to go for these ones. And then, I don't know if you will have heard this term heirloom is very common in tomatoes and it's like heirloom that they are super good they taste very good because they are all varieties and all of this um they are all lines so uh, imagine that we had like kind of a original tomato many 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 years ago instead of mixing that line of tomato with other new lines they have tried to keep it like as it is, instead of hybridize it with different, with the other different types of, of tomato plants. And they call that heirloom. So it's, it's a variety before 1951. And, and the idea of this is that is to maintain the genetic biodiversity, because if you are continuously mixing every plant, then you end up like a, with a, I don't know, with a mess, because all the genetic, uh, you have all the mixes because every, every mom plant is mixed with every father plant, so you have all type of children. But if you keep the, uh, reproducing the lines with themselves, you keep the original tomato. So this is what, they do, what, what it does. It does necessarily doesn't need to taste better. It's just that it's like the more, more, more original. That, that's it. And they are open pollinated. They are not hybrids. So yeah, you may see this term in the shops as well. And actually, there are some seeds providers that are more specialized in heirloom or more antique varieties like real seeds. That they have a lot of more old varieties or rescue varieties. Now, we're going to go a bit into the new vocabulary. So we have variety, and I have, been in, I have it mentioned it several times. So here you can see three aubergines, and the names that are inside of the square are the name of that variety. So as you can see, the one in the in the uh, uh, right is smaller, and then they, we have these other two that are bigger and longer. So then in the first one, you see that it it's me it's written grafted. So this means that the stem of this plant is matched with the root of another plant, as we have seen earlier. And here we can see F1. So this is a hybrid that has two different plants on it, and from this variety. This one is, is not grafted, is not hybrid, so it will be open pollinated and is from that variety. And this one is hybrid because it's F1 and it's from this variety. So as you can see, you can have all these terms mixed up in the name of one plant. This is what we wanted to mention. So when you see this, it's not like, boof, I have no idea what it is. Like, like you can see all of these terms in the same name. Then we have morphology. And these are the typical green beans. I think in USA they call them green beans, and here we call them French beans or something like this. But it's these ones that we that we eat very often, and they can grow into different shapes in dwarf or bush. That is very like it's, it is short. This may be I don't know 25 centimeters from the ground, something like this. And then you can have it a uh, climbing, or they call it as well pole. French beans, and then they grow like a vine. They grow up, so you need to trail them to put them support, and and they trail up. So here you can see an example of 
the same thing, that is a French bean, but it can grow into different shapes. And this, you can also see it when you buy the seeds. It tells you if it's dwarf or if it's climbing. So it's another thing to pay attention. And yeah, as you can imagine, the climbing, they are going to need more space. You, are, you need to put the pole, so it is important to pay attention to this, otherwise you have one thing in mind and then they send you another thing and suddenly it starts to grow and you don't understand why. And it's because you bought climbing, no dwarf. So it's important. Um, then it also depends on the use. For instance, cucumbers, they you can you can see them as cucumbers for pickle. So you will cut them and put them in vinegar. So I guess that the consistency it has more consistency, so it can like keep the integrity when you put them in vinegar. Or you can have them a slicer, and these are more for salads. And this will also be indicated in the name, or it will be classified like this in the shop. So it's important if you if you want to make pickles, not buying a slicers and opposite. So it's another thing to put attention to. I tried to pass, but it yeah, okay. Now we have tomatoes, and this is another world totally. The world of the tomatoes. It yeah, it is huge, 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 huge. Um, there are very different types, and you are, all of you are familiar with this. We have the cherries, we have the cocktails. I, the cocktail, I think, is like a big cherry, if I'm correct. Then you have classic, that is the typical tomato from Tesco. Then you have the beef tomatoes that are these ones that are very nice, and you eat one and then you are full for days. Um, then you have the plums and the the plums and the baby plums that are just longer. So here you have a, one that is very long and then one that is shorter. And then you have all type of colors. You can have these ones that are more greenies with lines. You have the yellow one. So, and one interesting thing that I, that I found out when I was reading is that a vine tomato, it only means that it comes with the stem. So it's not that you have, you know, when you go to Tesco and you see, or to Waitrose or whatever, and you see vine tomatoes, it's only vine tomato because it comes attached to the, to the stem, but all the tomatoes come from the plant in a stem. So they are more expensive because when they come with the vine, they are more delicate and they last less in the shelf. But yeah, it's not that it's a special type of tomato, it's that they just come with the stem. I found it very interesting how they lie to us. <laughs> Then, um, and Christine has an interesting story with this. And as far as we know, this is only with tomatoes. They ha can be indeterminate and determinate. The determinate tomatoes, or they are also called bush tomatoes, they grow maybe less than a meter, maybe 50 centimeters or so, and then they just stop growing. And then they release flowers, and then all the flowers, more or less at the same time, transform in tomatoes. It's not going to grow more. So once it has is done, it's done. That's it. You cannot expect it to then continue growing and continue releasing plants. And then you have the indeterminate tomatoes. These ones start growing. And then when it has grown a bit, it starts to release flowers by the bottom. But it continues growing. So then it's going to release more and more flowers, more and more flowers, more and more flowers. And then in the bottom, the first flowers are going to transform into tomatoes, but it's going to keep growing and releasing flowers. So if you have a very long season, these plants can get, uh, in my garden, they get taller than me. In the end, I have a lot of difficulty to reach the top branches. So there is not a limit of their growth. Yeah. And Christine, if you want to tell your story. What about the, uh, the bush tomatoes? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was just that before I knew this, um, I assumed that uh, when a tomato plant grew, you pinched out the sides, which you do do with the, uh, in the I can't even say it, indeterminate, that's it, ones. So um, I had this bush tomato and it started growing. I, I started picking out all the side shoots. Of course, I didn't realize you should just let, leave the uh, determinate ones just to grow. Um, so I ended up, I think, with one, maybe two tomatoes, and I, I didn't understand why, whereas all of my other different varieties were all growing away. So um, now I know what to do with a bush tomato. Bush tomatoes um, are good for pots as well, so because yeah. um, they, they only grow to a certain size. So, um, yes. So that is, that is why it's important to know what you are buying, because your 
it depends how you're going to behave with the plant later on. Yeah, and you can end up with yeah, only one tomato after a lot of effort yeah. and, a, and a lot of love. So it's, it is important knowing these things when you are going to buy seeds. Yeah. And it is true that maybe if you buy an indeterminate tomato and you put it in a pot, then you end up like with a monster <laughs> that grows out of the pot and you don't yeah. know what to do with it. So it is true that it depends where you are going to place it. It is important, yeah. We have put here some uh, good seed suppliers that we like or that we use more often. These are from from UK, I think. I don't know, Plant Wall. But yeah, I think they're UK, yeah. Yeah, from UK, because we are all... It's not very well known, but um, I've just ordered a whole load of seeds off of them, so... Uh, you will let us know how, how I it I will goes. let you know, yeah. Yeah, but well, what uh, Christine and I, we were thinking, and um, we can facilitate this, is doing an exchange of seeds. Because, for instance, I I have a lot of seeds of spaghetti squash at the moment. And I'm not going to plant 20 spaghetti, spaghetti squash. I'm not going to. So it's a pity for me, like, having extra seeds. Like, I would rather go to go give to Christine a couple and to another person another couple than keeping them in myself, myself, where they are going to die. So our idea, and also seeds are expensive. And why are you going to buy 50 or sometimes a package of 100 if you just need maybe 10? Like it's a it's a pity and it's a waste. So if you yeah, want, yes. yeah. sorry, Alex. Yesterday, I, I, from this company that I'm I'm trying out, um, there was a particular variety of cauliflowers, and there was 400 seeds in there. And I thought, well, I'm never going to grow 400 yeah. cauliflowers in that dirt. They are going to die mm. much, yeah, before you are going to because they last maybe three four years in the package. Or uh, the carrots even one year, so it's a yeah. yeah, it's a pity. It's a pity when you need to order more. So what we can do is like agree. I'm going to buy carrots. I'm going to buy tomatoes. I'm going to buy this. Well, tomatoes you don't need to buy because Christine and I will probably have hundreds of seeds. Me, me, I have hundreds of different varieties. So you can start even for free if you want. So we will talk more at the end, but we can have some kind of uh, agreement with ourselves. And we can even meet and change, like if we, you know, like as you were changed. A seed swap. Yeah, like if we were changing cars when we were children, like I, I want this, I give you this. Uh, we can do something like this, and we can all save money. Yeah, and not throw away seeds. That is a pity. We will talk more at the end. Um, so now the next thing is a uh, leaf versus fruit. And you know that some, for some, from some plants we want the leaves, like spinach, kale, lettuce, uh, but we don't want the fruit. We're not interested in fruit. So we are interested in keeping the plant giving leaves for as long as possible. And for that, for growing leaves, plants in general need more nitrogen, that is a nutrient that is in the soil, and they need coolness. So they need to be shaded, more or less, although if they have like a sun, at the beginning of the of the of the day and at the end of the day is very nice but in summer if you put them like under i don't know 25 degrees this happen this they bolt that is that it's a they suddenly start to grow high 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 they release the seeds and there are no more leaves uh, oh. and then you don't have kale you don't have uh, lettuce you don't have anything so what is interesting for us for the leaves for having leaves is keeping them in the shade with very low temperature and, and giving them nitrogen versus fruit. So when you want fruit, you are not interested in a plant having very, very nice leaves and growing very tall. You are more interested in a plant that is going to invest in the fruits. And for that, um, you will give them more potassium especially when they are giving fruits. So at the beginning, maybe you give them more nitrogen so the plants grows and it's nice and healthy. But then when they start to fruit, it's more interesting giving them potassium. And they need lots of sun normally because it's the sun and the warmth that is going to stimulate them to fruit. <coughs> this is very important because this is going to help you to uh, organize your garden or your windowsill or whatever, especially. So it's very important. And now you have, a, when you are interested in actually the root of the plant, like in the beet, in, in beets and in the um, potatoes, and in this case you are not interested in the leaves or the fruits, also you can eat the leaves of the, 
beetroot. And then this what, what these plants need is more phosphorus, actually. Not not nitrogen, not potassium, but more, more phosphorus. This is going to help them to put all the nutrients in the in the root. That is the, the thing that you are going to eat. Another difference between plants is seasonal versus perennial. So the for instance the lettuce and many many other plants they are seasonal they survive only one year and then after that year you remove them from the space and then you have the space free the next year to plant something but you can also have perennials for instance asparagus um, uh, strawberries all the trees are perennial as well they survive year after year so once you have decided where you put them ah sorry they are going to be there year after year and you and most, in most of the cases, if you decide to remove them, they are going to die, or unless you do it very, very well. This is why it's very important knowing that when you are planning your garden, because then it's going to be too late. Too late. <laughs> and then you have a special things. For instance, tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes. <laughs> I tend to say tomatoes, but it's tomatoes. We know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These red things. Um, yeah, here in UK, they are seasonal. Because it, yeah, it, when it starts to be cold and wet, they normally die. But for instance, in other countries like Spain, they are perennial. They can actually survive the winter. So it is interesting how like, the plant by its nature is perennial and, they could, and it could survive. But just because the climate here is as it is, they can't. So this is some, a bit relative. But yeah, we need to, when, as we are in UK, we need to focus on what is seasonal and what is perennial here in UK. Then another difference is uh, when you have uh, seasonal plants, you can have several crops per year. For instance, lettuce. Lettuce, you can stay. Uh, I don't have lettuce because I'm, I'm not keen on lettuce, but you can spend some time uh, harvesting it and taking leaves and then the plant is done and then you have the space again. So in the same season, you can plant after you can plant in the same space several things. And this is very interesting if you have the smaller spaces because then you, got, you are more productive. So you can have a lettuce for some time and then decide that you want to plant potatoes in the same place. Um, and with, with potatoes it's the same. There are, I don't know, we were talking yesterday, like early potatoes, second early, main early, late, uh, late main, like Christmas potatoes. Like So in the same year you can have different, uh, you can plant several times different types of potatoes. So it's very interesting to take this into account. It's very interesting. If you want to complicate your life, otherwise you can just have one thing and that's it. So we are talking about lay layers of complexity and you can choose whatever you stop. Or you can plant just one potato and be happy. So yeah. And then we have this, yeah, as I say, these perennial plants that uh, they are going to be in the same place year after year. So once you have decided where, you, where they go, uh, you can move around strawberries for, isn't it? You can, I have, I have never done them, but if you, you can decide to change them if you are very careful with the root, but in general, it's better if you leave them, uh, that's it. Um, usually, usually sort of uh, three or four years, after about three or four years, it's, it's advisable to, to move them to a different spot or to um, transplant the, the little baby strawberry plants that grow at the end of the season, use the new ones then put them in a different position but generally speaking they should stay in the same spot the, the strawberries um, we're talking about yeah strawberries for several years yeah yeah and this is mint that will also keep coming year after year but mint expands a lot and takes over the space so christine and i will recommend you putting mint in a pot not in, in a pot, not, yeah not in the gown because it takes or, over or it'll be everywhere yeah it takes over and it becomes like more like a wheat so better in a pot um, and now, sorry, Christine, you're always in the middle. <laughs> um, now we're going to talk a bit about plant requirements. And this is also important when you are going to decide where you place a plant, you will see. And then how, how you like, how you plant it, if in a windowsill, if in the ground, if in a greenhouse, in a pot. So all these things are important. 
Wait. First, the warmth and the sun require. As yeah, we have talked already about some of them. For instance, tomatoes they require warmth and sun, but not as much as aubergines and peppers. So every plant is different. Uh, as we have talked, a spinach because we want more the leaf is going to be more in a cool and shaded spot. So this is very important. And if you want to be successful when you grow a plant, you should know about you should know about this. The root depth. In general, the, the tallest the plant can get, the deepest the substrate that it needs. So if it's a bush, this is why we told you that a bush tomato plant, it will be happy in a pot because it's not, go, it's not going to grow very tall. But a very big tomato plant that is going to grow almost two meters is going to need a nice root depth. Yeah. And then... Um, Different plants they need different space between between them, especially and this is this is also because of the root depth, but also the the leaves and how how big the aerial part grows. Of course, if the the plant is bigger, you are going to need to plant them with more space between them. If they are smaller, you can plant them closer. This is in, this is like in general, but you can also do interplanting, like planting a small thing between two things that are very big, so you can play with this. But again, it depends how complicated you want to make it. You can just plant one tomato plant and that's it. Or you can eat, make it more complicated and plant a beetroot close to a tomato plant. So it depends how, how much you want to complicate it. The dates for germination are also important. Because imagine that at the beginning of the season, when it's cool and nice, you want to put the spinach. And then later on, when it gets warmer, you are interested in another type of plant that needs more warmth for germinating. So in the same space, you can you can you can have one thing at the beginning of the season and then another thing later on when it is warmer. Again, this is if you want to complicate your life. <laughs> but you can play with this with the different with the different germination dates of the plants. And also the dates of planting. So some, we will talk more in the fourth session, but you can many times germinate the plants at home or in your greenhouse or wherever, and you can have them growing for some time and then you plant them. So one day, the one date is the day where you germinate. So when you put the seed and the seed opens and another day is when you actually plant the plant, the plant in the definitive place. Some of them you need to sow directly, but if like if you don't need to, to sow directly the, the seed, you can play with this. You can start them at home when it's warm, and then when when the, when the last frost passed, then you can plant it outside, and then you are a bit ahead of the game because you have to start them indoors. So yeah, and then, so this is, this is why these two dates are important when you are planning your garden. And again, but again, it depends how complex you want to make it. You can just plant really, maybe. Uh, the nutrient requirements, as we have seen, um, if you want leaves, they are more interested in nitrogen. When you want more of the fruits, they are more interested in potassium. So this is important. I'm sure that you have seen in the supermarket that when it is like May, June or something, suddenly there is a lot of food for tomatoes everywhere. And this is when you are growing the tomatoes in pots. But that time, normally they need a bit of extra help because they have run out of all the nutrients in the pot. And that has a specific balance for the tomatoes, for growing the tomatoes in the plant. So as you see, different stages of, of the life need different nutrients. So it is, it is important to know when you are growing the plant. Most, um, most composts um, will, will give enough nutrients for a certain amount of weeks. So if you, say, plant a small tomato plant um, uh, in fresh compost, that uh, the nutrients will actually um, run out after uh, so many weeks, and that's when you have to start um, making sure you, you feed them. This is just for pots. So, um, yeah. Or, um, or when you have ground, that you have to start them in pots inside before um, you transplant or something, yeah. Yeah, but um, it's very important because maybe your plant initially is very nice, very happy, nice leaves, and then the tomatoes are a disaster. 
and it's because they have run out of nutrients in the pot wow. where you had them. So it is actually very, very important now. And we will talk more about this, but normally when you see, like when you see the symptom that the plant is running out of nutrients, many times it's too late for the plant. Like you are not going to recover that plant because <laughs> it has started to die. This happened, this happened to me very often and it's very difficult to recover that plant. So it is better to be ahead of the game in general with plants that is difficult sometimes because they cannot speak they cannot tell you oh, i don't have nitrogen so you need to study feed me feed me yeah you need to you need sometimes to study a little bit to to know how you can help them like babies i guess now we're going to talk about some common vegetables that we think that they are the ones we feel more attracted to especially when we start we are not going to give you like the root depths of that plants or when you need to sow them because there are lists and lists and lists in internet and I am not a book and I don't want to be repeating the same. So we are going to provide you some links with that information but we are going to give you some uh, heads up or ideas that are going to that are going to help you to decide if you want that plant or not. Like they are very difficult or they are very easy. Or, look, if you have said in the garden, maybe this is not a good idea. So you can decide. Okay, but don't expect like an encyclopedia here because we think it doesn't make any sense. So potatoes. Uh, many of us we eat potatoes very often. So it is very easy crop. I, can, I mean, I will totally recommend it to a, to a beginner. Very, very easy. You just plant them. You more or less forget about them. And they just do their thing. And then, yeah, and then you have like these very special moments when you open the ground and then you find your first potatoes and then, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, as we have talked before, you can have several crops per year. So if you plant them very early, you are going to get them by midsummer, and then you can plant another one. Probably it needs to be from a, a different variety that is going to resist better the cold. And so you can have several crops of potatoes in the same year. So it's, it can be very productive, actually. Uh, and you can grow them in bags, in containers, or in the ground. So it's very, it's very flexible, very easy. Uh, I totally recommend this. What do you think, Christ Christine? Chipping? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you um, want. One thing I've learned about potatoes is that they do need a lot of water. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, 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 this year I did some in the ground. Um, planted them a little bit too early, they got a bit of frost damage, so they weren't all that good. And then I planted some in some really big tubs, and um, I got loads and loads. But uh, they definitely do need a lot of water, that's one thing for them. So. Yep. Mm. And the slugs love them. Not, and only if they're in the ground, but um, if you have them in pots, then you're, or big tubs. Like Ooh, mine have got to them in bars. Really? Yeah, yeah, and it has been like, wow. Like they have loved them really. Yeah. <laughs> for like a buffet for them. <laughs> then we have carrots and Christine had a good very good point yesterday and normally they don't look that beautiful. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's hard to grow nice carrots and this is true. Um, you need soft compost so that the, the root can penetrate nicely or you get funky carrots with two or three legs. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, they, they are very funny when you pull them and it's like, let's see, and then you get, yeah. Uh, but some of them can be, you can imagine, with several legs are a bit hard to cut <laughs> or, and to use, and then they are full of roots. And so with carrots, me, myself, I, I have almost given up. I say, or you do it properly or don't do it because you are, you are not going to use them, I think. They're, they're challenging. Carrots are, are challenging. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you might be lucky. You might be lucky, and you know. Yeah, but the the typical supermarket carrot, I think, is difficult to get. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then a uh, very important thing is that the cold improves the sweetness. So don't be, don't be, don't hurry to pick them out. Wait until it's cold because that is going to improve the taste of the carrots a lot. I, I have a lot of friends that are very impatient and they pick them in summer. And then they, they are, oh, oh, and they have pulled all the carrots and it's like, ah, you're too impatient, you still have way to it. <laughs> yeah. And they are very hardy. They can resist even the winter. So, yeah. yeah. I've still got loads of carrots in my... Um, yeah, me too. So. Yeah, me mm. too. They are, they are very hard. Mm. 
uh, asparagus. Uh, sorry if I mention it several times, but I have asparagus and, and I'm in love <laughs> with them. I go to see them. Hey. Uh, they are perennial, but it takes between two, three, or even four years to get the first harvest. So it's a long term crop. So yeah, I when when I got the seeds, I plant them all because I thought, yeah, God knows when I'm going to receive the first the first harvest. And it's better to plant them in the ground, but because they grow so slowly, I grow them in a I have um, I have them in a pot in a you know these council recycling bins that you probably shouldn't do that with uh, belonging from the council, but it's a perfect place because I can move it. If you don't know, Alex, yeah. Did, did you did you say you grew them from seed? Yeah. Oh, right, okay, because I, I was fortunate enough to be given three asparagus crowns. You can you can buy them as yeah. a crown, which already, they already have their, their sort of a root system. Um, so if you, you know, I, I would imagine from seed, you might have to wait a little bit longer, I don't know. Yeah, of course, because they need to develop, yeah, I guess yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah during the two, four, first four years, you're not going to receive any harvest because it needs yeah. to develop everything, yeah. And then yeah. The, it gets, it's, it's a very big... Uh, plant like if you see it's like one meter and a half it can get very bushy yeah, yeah. what is nice i don't know i love this asparagus in spain they grow you can go to the field and you just pick them it's very nice oh. ah, ah, this is an extra but i thought it was very interesting we are going to talk a bit about the big brassicas like cauliflower cabbage the Bras 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 brussels sprouts broccoli kale or kohlrabi is a bit strange thing and all of them came from the wild master plan um, so this is why sometimes people talk about brassicas in general because they all came originally from the same plan so i just wanted to mention that like if you see people talking continuously about the same this is the reason the origin was the same um, yeah so these are the broccoli kale cauliflower brussels sprouts you will see that all of them have more or less the same leaf they work more or less in the same way. For extended harvest, we recommend uh, purple sprouting broccoli and kales. Yeah. They are different types of kales. That, uh, for instance, if you have the typical broccoli from the supermarket that is only one head, then you cut the head and that is basically it. You are going to receive some small shoots, but you know, after so many months of having an, a big plant, because they are big plants, they're in your garden, you just receive like a head. And I don't know, I prefer having something that is going to be releasing shoots and things now and then and I can take uh, like harvest during a long period of time. That's why, and you can do this with the kales as well, because you take the leaves that you need and then the plant continue growing. So we recommend you that. We don't recommend you cauliflowers to start with. Me, I, me, I haven't still figured out how to grow a beautiful cauliflower. They are horrible. They get green, and they start like I don't know. <laughs> they look... Cauliflowers are very difficult. Yeah. yeah, we. I'm struggling with them. Yeah, I'm we struggling. we don't recommend you to start start with cauliflowers. I mean, if you want to try, I have a lot of seeds, so I give them for you to for free because I I kind of give up. Like, yeah, and you get yeah the same. You get one cauliflower after so. So sometimes, I don't know, I would prefer having a tomato plant or something that I know is going to be give me, giving me things for a long time and you, um, yeah, it's more effective for me and for my household than a cauliflower that is going to give me one head. But yeah, everyone is different. Uh, these plants are also very hardy and they can resist the winter. Like I'm sure that this thing you have broccoli and kales still, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um the, the uh, broccoli from the uh, purple sprouting broccoli, this is what uh, we see in supermarkets as uh, the tender stem. Um, Very expensive. So that, yeah, that's what they look like, yeah. Very but expensive. There, there, there is one thing about brassicas is that um, it's sometimes recommended to um, cover them with uh, um, a netting because um, uh, the cabbage white butterfly loves them um, and um, also the birds, pigeons love them as well. So. But the... Um, in the problems, in the session four, I think we're going to be, we are going to talk about there is a, a bacteria that you can spread and it's considered yeah. organic uh, organic gardening, actually, that can avoid yeah. that. Is what I do. I don't use mess. So there are there are options. But yeah, it is true. If you don't take care of that, I mean, you say goodbye <laughs> to your plants. Well, around my way, the pigeons are really, yeah, they're horrible things. Yeah, 
they can decimate a whole crop yeah. overnight. That's good. I don't have pigeons. That's good. No. No, I haven't had any problem. But I mean, I go like a crazy person every time I see a a, a, a bird. I go out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Different different ways. That is organic, totally. I mean, me shouting. Um, beet beetroots. Uh, we totally recommend them. You can eat the leaves actually in salad or in soups. So. Um, and it needs phosphorus because again it's the root what we want and it tolerates the shade so it's a very good companion plant to plant between other type of plants but yeah this is only as an extra if you want to maximize the use of the space uh, there are different varieties as well uh, if they receive sun they go to seed as well so it's recommended not to not to put them in a very warm and sunny spot Anything to add? Um, no, no. I was just looking at the time. We've, we've only got about 15. If, if we stick into an hour, we've got about 15 minutes left. So oh, I know oh. there's quite a lot um, to come. Yeah, that's true. Around. Well, yeah. if people get overwhelmed, maybe we can stop <laughs> at some point and, okay. leave it, and leave it for the next one. Um, onions, we recommend them as well. They are easy. They can grow in the pot or in the ground. You can use them again. You can plant them between other plants as well, and they survive the winter. They continue growing during the winter. Now it's a bit late to plant them, to to germinate them. Um, oh, well, I, I actually germinated quite a few probably about four weeks ago. Yeah. But if you've got somewhere, to, if you're fortunate enough to have a greenhouse, then you, you can, because they, they take a long time to develop. Yeah. Um, but to put them directly in the ground, I don't think so. Like, yeah, it will need no. to be warm now. Yeah. But you can put in the ground garlic. Now is a good moment of the year to put the garlic down if you want. Yep. And because this is a small, it doesn't take a lot of space. Yeah, it's a good first thing to try. And it's the same. It's going to take several months to harvest, so it's good. Yeah. And you can just go to the supermarket and um, buy a, um, a garlic bulb, just break it up. You'll probably get about between yeah. 10 and 15 cloves and then just pop them in your soil about an inch down. Um, and it'd probably take about two or three weeks for them to start coming up, but they're really easy. Yeah, really easy. this is how it looks like. It's as complicated as this. Yeah. So it can yeah. be very, very simple. Yeah. Peas are a super nice thing. We, we'll, we, we, we recommend it for beginners as well. You can have several crops per year because it doesn't take very long for them to grow. They need a bit of support because, yeah, this uh, is it's like a vine. You see, it has these dendrils that, yeah, got, got got attached. So you need to put branches or a mesh or something for them to grow. And because you can have several crops per year, it's good if you put them in an in a accessible place. Like don't put them in the corner of in the corner of the garden where you need to, I don't know, it, that is very difficult to get because you are probably going to harvest some of them for dinner now and then and then. They're going to remove the plants and plant them again, so it's nice to have them close by. Yeah, and a sweet, tender uh, pea is the best of the world. If you compare it with the full frozen one, like, I mean, my my husband, when he goes to harvest them, he eats half of them as yeah. he's harvesting them because they are so delicious when they are tender. You don't need to cook them. Yeah, please plant peas. They're wonderful. Um, tomatoes, of course, is a warmth lover and sun lover. If you are going to start with them, we recommend smaller varieties like cherries because a, a bigger tomato takes longer to, to, to grow and chances are that there are more chances that it runs out of nutrients or you punch them or there is some kind of accident or whatever. So cherries are very nice to start with and they need support as well. Uh, they will need some kind of... Um, well, if it's a big tomato, it's going to need a big support. If it's a, it, it depends how big it is. But you need to tr learn how to trail them or how to support them so they grow upright and nice. There are many different ways. If you're checking your tooth, there are so many, so many ways. It depends where you are going to put them. Yeah. Overgin is kind of the same, warm lover. The smaller varieties are easier. So like this one. I have one in my greenhouse and it works very well and it's like very small. And they also need some support, especially when they start to have the fruit that is quite heavy. The plant like doesn't know what to do, <laughs> so it needs some support. 
papers and chilies, they are relatively easy. So we encourage you to, to start with these ones as well. They like warmth and sun and they also need support, especially when they start to have the fruits. Yeah. Cucumbers, it's, everything is more or less the same. It's, they like warmth and sun. Uh, they also need support. Here you can see that it, it is like in a, it has a mess, so you need to support them somehow so they can grow. Uh, the only thing when you are buying them, it is better if you buy self-pollinating varieties. And uh, so, so the plant itself can pollinate itself instead of that you need several plants to work together. And in some varieties, you need to remove some uh, some flowers, or the fruit will taste bitter. So you need to read a bit how that particular uh, variety of cucumber works. Buy something that it is not going to give you more more work. We will recommend you this with the cucumber. Have a read in the description of the plant for your sake. <laughs> Cuyet is, is my favorite, favorite, I have to say. My plants are super, super productive. At, 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 I don't know, like last year we calculated, this year was worse, that we saved maybe easily 300 pounds in cuyets. Like, um, like two plants give an amazing amount of cuyets. Then you don't know what to do. You don't know how to eat them. We started to do this cuyet, uh, chocolate, uh, bread, like you start to get creative, you give to all your family, to your friends, like it's a very fun plant. You can eat the, le the flowers as well, you can do tempura or fill in them. Uh, yeah, I would really, really recommend you this plant. It's a warm flower and it needs quite a lot of space. Also, you can have them in a pot if you are skillful. And the, first time, the first time I did um, courgettes, um, I think I had 17 plants and my na my neighbours were saying, please, no more courgettes, please. <laughs> I had to give them away. That's a lot of plants. Yeah, a lot of plants, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's impossible for one person eating this, like, totally impossible, or even for a two, family. Two plants is maximum, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, be that's why it doesn't make sense to buy many seeds. So, yeah. if you get a seed from someone, like five seeds, to see, yeah, so it's not, it's not worth... Um, you may need these these plants. They work by pollination, and when you don't have enough pollination, they may look like this, and they are not successful. That's why it's good to have other type of flowers in your garden, or you may need to go with a brush and help the flowers themselves, or you may end up like this. This has happened to me before, yeah, and it it is very bad. You feel very sad. Uh, spinach or chard, they are very easy. We, we also recommend them. You can have several crops per year. And as we have said, because it's a leaf, they is better if you plant them in a shady and cool place. But very recommended. Yeah. And strawberries, yeah, we have talked about them as well. Easy, in a sunny spot. They are perennial, although you can move them around. And they can grow in a pot or in the ground. Uh, yeah, very nice. There is always a fight in your household to see who eats the strawberries. <laughs> but they are very, 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 very nice and tasty. They're very hardy as well. Yeah, they yeah. survive very well. Yeah. Uh, lettuce, and I'm about to finish, I promise. Easy. They also need a savvy and cool place because you want the leaves. You can harvest them uh, several times. You just collect the leaves outside, like in the spinach, and they keep growing and growing. You can have several crops. When it finishes, you can put another crop if you want. And you can grow them in a pot or in the ground. Yeah. And this is when... I don't know how... People, do you want to unmute ourselves and tell me how overwhelmed you are? If one or two want to tell me... A little bit. We're really enjoying it. So what what do you prefer? We continue or we leave this for the next session? Next session. Carry on. Oh. Not really sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you can all disconnect a bit now and we can always you can always come back to the tape later on unless unless of course you you there are questions that um, need to be asked I had questions but I can't remember what they were and I've got to I've got to go off and dog sit now oh right okay. um, I'm just trying to think uh, yeah, I suppose for me, the, the seed thing is the biggest uh, confusion. Um, because I'm down in Brighton, so I don't know how I can get involved in the seed sharing. Wait, but, I mean, one seed is super light. Like, how much is going to cost send you one letter with some seeds? Almost nothing. Oh, okay, so that would, people would be happy to post. But to post. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can, yeah. yeah, especially with COVID. I mean, we are going to need to post. But I mean, it's going to be cheaper to send you an envelope with some seeds than, f than for anyone to buy five different packets of 50 seeds. You see what I mean? It's, it's going to be much, much cheaper. So we can easily agree between ourselves and send post. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind. I don't, yeah, I don't mind helping to organize and we do this. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, and you will send a link to the rest of, to this video. Yeah, the same. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. No worries. No worries. Yeah. If you are so overwhelmed. But you need to disconnect. You can. You can always come back here. Yeah. And, and I, then I get to see the rest of the session that you're continuing with now. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Thank Have you, Osiwan. Uh, yeah. Cheers. Bye. Bye, Christine. Bye. Bye. Okay, Rachel. We continue then. I'll stay. Yeah. You can. You can disconnect. <laughs> like, you take it lightly now. Um. Uh, yeah, because this is my favorite part, but this is when it gets a bit more complicated. But it is very useful when you have a smaller spaces as I have, that you need to maximize and, and you want to get as much harvest as possible. Then you need to start to play. You need to start to uh, read more about the different plants and their needs. And it's then when you can go one step forward. Um, and this is a beautiful story to give an example of how this works how companion planting works. I don't know if you have heard about this. They are called the Three Sisters, and uh, it was the Native Americans who used to, ha who used to um, cultivate in this way. They cultivate corn, pumpkin, and beans together. So the corn, because they grow in, in the highest stalks, will help the beans to grow, like the beans will grow around the stalks of the, of the corn, so it will support them. And then they will put the pumpkin in the ground. So the leaves of the pumpkins, because they are very big, they will save the ground and they, that will stop uh, weeds to grow and they will st it will stop the evaporation of the water. So they will plant this. Will plant Sorry? Oh, God. I'm going to silence you again. Ah, well, most of them are silence anyway. Um, so... So yeah, these three plants will help each other. These three plants will help each other to, to grow. And this is how the companion plant it started. Uh, how you can do it in your garden? For instance, you can put a borago or a plants from the family Labiatae, and these ones will help to attract pollinators to your garden because as you have seen... Right, I can't hear you, um, I can't hear you Alex. You muted yourself, Alex. Oh no, I have been talking alone, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, how you, can, how you can do it in your garden. You can put plants from, like this plant that is called Borago, or plants from the family Labiatae, like Rosmarinus, Basil, and these plants will attract pollinators. As you can see... Borago, um, borago is, is borage, yes? Ah, borage, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Boric. That's okay. Boric. They, they, try to, they tend to attract pollinators, and you need pollinators for the rest of your plants, for many of the other plants of your garden, so it's good to have bees and other, other insects that are going to help you in general in the garden. You can have uh, this plant that is called nast nastrutium. Nastertium. Really? Oh. <laughs> we call it nastertium. Nastertium. And uh, they call it the sacrifice plants because many of the pests that will attack other of your plants will attack this plant it's in, instead. So it's good to put it and to sacrifice it so, yeah, so the rest of your plants are safe. Marigold is another very typical plant. 
and this is meant to protect the roots of other plants from nematodes. So you can very often find it interplanted with other other plants. If you have been in our salon, this is a, the marigolds is the plant that we had in the planters outside because it's very beautiful as well and it smells good. This is as complicated as it can get. <laughs> Companion planting. This is a table of they are the same plants uh, up and on the side and it tells you which plant goes well with what. So this can get very 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 complicated but you don't need to make it that complicated for yourself. So I want to give you some rules of thumb that you can use in your garden. Um, so for instance, keep the crops with the short harvesting time at hand, like the peas, the, the kitchen gardens. So if you have a very deep garden uh, or one place that is very difficult to access, don't put there the peas and the kitchen herbs. Put them close to you because you are going to be harvesting them very often. Uh, you can, if you have a smaller space, you can think, can you fit several crops in the same space? For instance, can you put first lettuce and then plant the tomatoes? So this is another way of, of thinking. Uh, in the remote places, for instance, in that part of the garden that is more difficult to access, put plants that have a long harvesting, no long harvesting time, no, uh, well, that they need a long time to mature, like the kales, or garlic or onion so you don't need to be walking up and down your garden all the time just let them be avoid putting plants that are very demanding together like cucumbers and tomatoes aubergines peppers these are all plants that have very big fruits and um, um, courgettes they are plants that have very big fruits and are going to demand, demand a lot of sun and nutrients so it's better if you separate them instead of putting them very close together. Otherwise, they are going to compete with each other. The potatoes inhibit the growth of some plants. So me, myself, I, I put them alone and I don't tend to plant them with any anything else. I let them be. I have them in bags and they grow very well. And don't mix garlic and onion together. Don't put them very close. And don't put plants that are from the same family, like umbelifers, umbelifers? together, like carrots, coriander, um, there are more fennel. They are all some from the same family and they can cross pollinate between, between them because they are very similar. So it's better to keep them apart, so to, to not to mix them. Uh, and then we go with the homework. Um, you have, you are supposed to do a, have a list done with the veggies that you like, and you are supposed to have thought about the space that you have already. If it's a windowsill, a raised bed, if you have done something in the back of your garden. Now you have information about the requirements of the space, warmth, and sun because we have been talking about it, and you have information about companion planting. So now you have enough knowledge to start to really plan a map your space and I'm going to show you an example of one of my raised beds and it's a sunny raised bed so as you can see here the corridor is there and the corridor is there um, so these are the parts that I can access this side I cannot access very well and first I place my tomatoes and you can you may very well stop here you are just interested in tomatoes you want to take it easy this this first season and you just put the tomato and you stop there. Now, because I'm a nerd and I like these things and I have very little space, I I want to do more things. And then I decided to put garlic because garlic is very small. It's going to repel some insects from the tomatoes and with tons of garlic because my husband is from India. So I just put garlic everywhere. Especially in the sites, in the, in the places that I cannot access, if you see. In the places where I cannot access, because it has a long development. Now, basil, um, I like it as well. And I use it in the kitchen. So I put it close to the corridors, in places that I can access, if you see. And basil is supposed to enhance the flavor of the tomatoes. So it is useful and it is going to help to the other plants in this raised bed. Then I put marigold here and there 
because it's going to protect the roots of the tomatoes from the nematodes. And then, because I still have some space, I put some uh, beetroot because it's going to grow in the shade well. And this one here is borage. 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 That is going to attract pollinators uh, and bees because bees love it. So it's going to help to pollinize the tomatoes. So that will be a race bait, very complicated. Uh, with long harvest time, you can harvest different things. Um, yeah. This is as complicated as it can get. But you need to know your plants and the different requirements. So your homework for now, till the next session, will be planning your garden, mapping your garden, and planning your garden. Here is a sowing timeline, so it goes month by month, and you can see which plants you, which uh, yeah, which plants you sow. So you germinate each month. So first you can decide what you are going to plant and where, and then you can plan. So you have a timeline or what do you need to do each month. So that will be your homework. Now, in the next session, we are going to talk about compost, but we are going to talk, we are going to do a little homework about design your garden. And this is going to be more interactive. Everyone is going to be with a microphone open. And we are going to take an example from my garden and I'm going to explain to you as now how I have uh, designed it. And then we're going to take one example from you and we're going to help you to design your garden. So it, it will be good if for next time you bring some pictures and some ideas of what you want so we can help you a bit. And that can be useful for everyone. And the session four is going to be about this. I think that this is going to be too much for one session, so we may pass it to another one. We will see. Um, yes, this all will be, so today is 12th of December, so the next one will be the 9th of January. So Christina has time to prepare her talk about the comp compost. Christina is our compost expert. Oh, hardly an expert. <laughs> and that's it. Now we can go to the questions, if you want. How I go? Ah, and see the exchanges. We can, if people are happy with this, we can help to organize this so we don't need to buy a lot of seats, each of us. So maybe if you maybe if you want to ask a question, if you put your hand up and then we can do one at a time, yeah. rather than everyone chipping in. Martin. Martin. Um, I wanted to buy a bean compost because I no longer own one. And I just wondered if you had um, some advice on what to choose. Uh, I don't want to start with something complicated, uh, the, the one you have, which is the hot one, but just the basic right. um, compost bin. Um, and unless you're going to make one yourself from, say, pallets, um, then probably one of the Dalek ones um, will probably be the best. Uh, but, I mean, we're, we're going to be Alden talking... Center. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to be talking about um, uh, compost and all the different types and you know what will be best for your garden. So we'll be doing that next time. They are the garlic ones. They are more or less the same. All of them. It's like a a bean with a hole up, and then it has like a little uh, I don't know what to say, like a little window that you open to get the things from the bottom. That is the. Uh, yeah, I the, used to have one of those. Yeah. yeah so yeah. many times, a long time ago. And the, the second other question, it might be too early. But I, I, I had this year an infestation of snails, right. and I really didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and if you had either today or sometime in the future some advice on how to deal with it in a, in a, in a kind way, yeah. we are wow. going to talk. We are going to talk about that. It's a, the kindest way is very time consuming. You will need to pick them one by one, put them in a bottle bring them at least two kilometers, two kilometers far from you. There was even a PNC done with someone that just he was throwing away, at, because it, it was one of my colleagues, throwing away uh, um, sl slugs and snails over the fence, and they were coming back to the way home. So yeah, you there, need... there was an experiment. Someone had uh, painted some uh, nail varnish on the back yeah. of the slug, uh, the snails, threw them away, and they had actually come back into the garden. Yeah, it was my colleague. She was telling me the story. So it's, yeah. it's a real story. So the best is if you collect them and you move them away. You release them in a park. Otherwise, they will come back. Yeah. And what's the, the other organic option? Uh, 
I think the only the only way is uh, if, uh depending on how much. It, sorry. It's pellets, I suppose. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend pellets because um, even though they say they're wildlife friendly, uh, I don't I don't trust them. So um, unless the unless you're putting them down where the uh, vegetables are actually covered in netting, so the birds and the frogs and all that sort of thing can't get in. Then um, you know I wouldn't just scatter them around because um, you know especially uh, hedgehogs and that sort of thing because um, if the slug or the snail eats the pellet and dies then the the wildlife might still eat the the actual um, you know yes, yes. there are snuff. there are different type of pellets we will talk more in the session about pellets because I have I have you used to say snail or snuff then. <laughs> Because I have to say, I have used pellets. After a long research, I have used them. But I, it took me some time to read about um, a specific one that will melt and it will only add iron and it's totally hedgehog and frog and wildlife friendly. But yeah, it requires a bit of explanation. But no, buy, for sure don't buy any type of pellet because they can be very, very damaging. Like The composition needs to be very specific to be wildlife friendly. So yeah, please wait. I have a friend. With the no with the no dig method, after a while the the um, uh, slug and snail population sort of goes down. Um, oh, but oh the, yeah, I mean I have a friend who collects all the snails in her garden. She puts them in one of those bags that you get sort of like tangerines in, and then hangs it up for the birds. So um, <laughs> not very not very nice. <laughs> That's one way of getting rid of them. Yeah. And me, and me personally, I have given up during winter. This winter, I'm not having anything because I don't feel, I don't, feel, I mean, I have millions of slugs. Like, I go this, if I go out to a day of rain, I go like I have a panic attack. So I say, okay, I'm going to chill. I will take care of it in February. I will do these several rounds of putting them in a bottle and bringing them away. But yeah, I don't want to do it all the winter. No. You can um, uh, also make yourself a little wildlife uh, pond if you've got room. And then if you get sort of frogs in, frogs, you know, if you, um, uh, you know, make a nice little habitat for them, then they will come and um, eat your um, slugs and uh, slugs and snails, yeah. And it's very interesting to have a frog hopping around. Oh, oh yeah, yes. I've got my Mr. Froggy in my pond. So. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? No, it's a busy. I'm ready. Oh. ready. Hello. Hello. Yeah, just uh, wondering uh, where do you find the supplements or oh, nutrients for the, the plant? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can find them in garden centers in Tesco. You can in Tesco you see a lot. Like when the season arrives, there is like a lot of uh, little bottles with um, yeah with the with the nutrients and um, but it is a world as well. In general. The nutrients, uh, these supplements are more needed when you have a pot because then you dilute it in water and you can just put it. So it's very useful when you have pots. But in if you have a space on the back, like if you have ground or an allotment or something, the best is having a healthy soil. If you have a healthy soil, you don't need supplements. So it's more yeah. if you have a pot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we might go into this later, but you can yeah. actually make your own um, plant fertilizers yeah, um, with uh, comfrey or nettles. So it's not a pleasant um, um, process, but um, it's you know, free, and um, you know you don't have to buy plastic bottles. So, yeah. it, it stinks very badly, yes. very very <laughs> badly. So if you have neighbors, you have to choose very carefully where you put it because yeah, it is really really stinks. It's like a nettle tea, but we will yeah. talk how to elaborate it in one of the sessions, so you don't need to buy anything. Yeah. Yeah. You can also pick, um, what is the name, seaweed and do a fertilizer with seaweed and it's very nice because it has a lot of minerals. So, yeah, we, we are going to recommend these kind of things so we are the most sustainable and eco-friendly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so at the moment we only have windows in. So what soil okay. should we buy? What's the best for indoor soil? You have Just a to... general pur purpose um, compost, I think. But you have yeah. to read the back and check because some compost, especially the ones that are very cheap, the amount of nutrients are very, very low. I have experienced this myself, like, oh, this one is only one pound, a uh, yeah. sack of 25 kg, and you plant something and in one month it's like, like, gone. Yeah, that happens to us. Yeah, yeah, so checking the back, 
the composition of the and the amount of nutrients because sometimes they mix a like a like a, a lot of soil with a very poor compost and it is yeah it's a substrate yeah. but it's not actually giving a lot to the plant so check the bark and find also, something hmm? so i also I try to get a peat free one yeah yeah so without peat so most of them do have peat in and that's not very ecologically friendly so yeah peat peat is a sphagno that is a moss that it grows very very slowly and is what is going to transform in petrol and coal over time over time so they have been over harvested basically they have removed yeah. a lot to make to make compost so it's very bad to use to use it yeah. Yeah. and do you have any experience of growing an avocado yes because we have one and it's already one and a half years right and so far it's growing well but we just worry that the soil may be running out of nutrients you you'll so. probably need to repot it every every so often but um i've got two avocado plants in uh, my greenhouse and um, one is nearly as tall as me now um but it takes about between i think five and 15 years for them to actually fruit so they're they're nice as house plants <laughs> they're nice as house plants but um i'm not sure they'll i don't know of anyone in this country that actually had any fruit off of them so, mm -hmm. i mean they get enormous i mean yeah. they can be massive yeah. My mom planted one of the first avocados that I ate when I was a baby and the plant had 20 years when it died because uh, one summer they forgot to put water and she was very, very sad. Oh. And in 20 years it didn't fruit. Mm. So, well, we're enjoying it. Though. But it was, but it was well, a very nice plant. I mean, it was super beautiful tree. She was very sad when, she, when it died because yeah, it, it lived with her 20 years. So yeah, but don't expect avocados. <laughs> Yeah, they make nice house plants though. Yeah, I I planted. Uh, if you want to plant something, I would recommend you lemons. I have a, I planted some uh, lemon seeds and the tree. Of course, it's going to take some years, but I believe they can give lemons even when they are pretty small. Yeah. And I, and I have them in pots, so you uh, in pots inside because of course in they need warmth. It's like a Mediterranean plant. So if you want a tree that what that at some point will give fruit, lemons are a good thing. More questions. Martin is taking notes of everything. <laughs> 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 uh, my my sister, my brother-in-law, do have a lemon tree, but of course they live in the south of France. Oh. Yeah. So they always get. And my father also uh, used to get every Friday. They would eat um, um, uh, fish in the south of France, and every Friday he picked up one new lemon from his lemon tree. But they do have, uh, because it's the south of France, it's so close to Spain, they do have more sun, maybe, a little bit yeah. more sun than we do here. Yeah, here you have to have them inside, yeah. yeah. Yes, that's it. Samu, you wanted to ask something? You are unmuted, you are muted. Okay, hello. Hello. Yes, if I want to start planting some kitchen hairs, for example, is that something I can do now inside? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Well, mostly, mostly all of them, really. Okay. If they're going to stay inside, yeah. The well, only thing... got a nice sunny window still. Yeah, I, I yeah. have a window still that is not really sunny and they all have grown very leggy. Very leggy is when they, they are looking for the sun, so the stem starts to grow, 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 grow. And yeah, and it takes a long time until they have the first leaves because it's desperately looking for the sun. So in general, it's better to plant in the spring when they are going to receive a fair amount of sun, but you can grow them now. Yeah, They are not going to be the prettiest, probably. Cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Peas, you could try peas now, garlic. Mm. Even in a windowsill. Mm. You can grow peas just for the shoots. So rather than let them grow big, you just, just pinch off the shoots. Uh, and you can, I don't know if you've seen them in supermarkets, you can actually buy bags of pea shoots. So, and that's what they are. So if you, you know, you can germinate them now, when they get to about, you know, four or five inches high, just pick off the tops. Very nice. Pop them in your salad, yeah. More questions, or everything is crystal clear. <laughs> 
you will receive the, the, the tape so you can put it again and again and again. Yeah, I know it's a lot of information. I said more than crystal clear is so many ideas that now I want to just go back through all of the plans and decide yeah. which one can I start with. Yeah, and if you if you think about this before the next session, like we're going to have half an hour of uh, yeah, brainstorm and helping a couple of you to organize your things. So if you think a bit about it, next time we can help. And you can always send an email to us later on yeah. as well. Like if you have any like, oh, I don't know if carrots or cauliflower. Yeah, Martin. One, one last question. I'm actually seriously considering uh, taking an allotment and I have a look around and everything is about waiting lists. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you have any advice on how is the easiest way to get in or is it just to put your name on the waiting list and wait? Definitely put your name down. Uh, on all of the allotments close to you um, and just sit back and wait or every now and again ring them and say where am I on the list and make a nuisance of yourself I mean I waited six and a half years for mine oh, so, right. uh, yeah so but you might be lucky it depends where you are depends where you are many uh, times uh, a person even if they don't use the allotment uh, they cannot remove the allotment, allotment from that person until it dies so many times you the list moves just because people are dying, so imagine. Yeah. Right. I have seen as well in some of them that they have volunteers, but I suspect it's volunteer from outside. I mean, that would be a good way to learn as well. Well, if you if you get uh, chummy with someone who's got an allotment, then um, you know they might need a hand. I know there's a couple of people on where I am. Um, they work full time and uh, sort of they can only get there on the weekend, but. Uh, Sometimes, you know, they get other people, friends of theirs, who come along, do the watering and all that sort of thing. So hang around allotments. Put your name yes. down first. Hang around allotments and get chatting to people. Yeah. And I only know one couple who already has an allotment, and I did send them an email to there just to make sure. Yeah, yeah. It could be useful. Well, I mean, it was only to learn. Yeah, yeah. Else. I mean, it's, um, uh, you know, they say to, to cultivate uh, one full allotment takes about 14 or 15 hours a week. So it is a lot of work. So there's a lot of people that can't spare that amount of time. So they're, they're often, you know, looking for people to help out, even if, even if it's just to do a bit of weaving, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good to know. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, we are all saturated now. Okay, yep. do the homework, please do the homework. So the next session we can help you more because it's going to be more interactive. So it's for the next session it will be for your benefit mostly. Yeah. Okay. Thank Good. you so much. Thank you. Have the a lovely Saturday. Is 9th of January, yeah. 9th, yes. Yeah. yeah. So then. Yeah, but I will. It's the ninth, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Bye. Bye.